Okay, this time we're covering OSHA. Uh, we're pretty near the end of the second day, and uh, we're going to cover the OSHA regulations. The rules of construction. The general contractor can make arrangements to have a subcontractor responsible for providing required items, such as a first aid kit, toilets, and water. However, this does not relieve the general contractor of the responsibility. In no case shall a prime contractor be relieved of the overall responsibility for compliance. Where joint responsibility exists, both the prime contractor and his subcontractor or subcontractors, regardless of their relationship, shall be considered subject to the enforcement provisions of this act. So, you can't say, oh, that was my subcontractor's fault, he's supposed to do this. That doesn't relieve you of responsibility. Just like with the state of Florida, the OSHA federal regulations, if anything goes wrong, it's the contractor's fault. General safety and health provisions, the use of any machinery, tool, material, or equipment which is not in compliance with any applicable requirement of this part is prohibited. If any machine is broken, damaged, or not working as it's supposed to, you can't use it. And if you do use it, you can be fined. If anybody gets hurt, you can be fined seriously. Such machine, tool, material, or equipment shall either be identified as unsafe by tagging or locking the controls to render the item inoperable or shall be physically removed from the place of operation. Medical services and first aid. You must have access to medical attention, access to 911, and knowledge of how to get to the closest hospital or clinic. The contents of the first aid kit have to be replaced have to be placed in a weatherproof container with individual sealed packages for each item and shall be checked by the employer before being sent out to each job weekly. They'll ask you that on the exam very often. How often must you replenish the first aid kit? And the answer is weekly. Potable water. An adequate supply of potable water shall be provided in all places of employment. Portable containers used to dispense drinking water shall be capable of being tightly closed, equipped with a tap, and the water shall not be dipped from the containers. Any container used to distribute drinking water shall be clearly marked as, as the nature of its contents and not used for any other purpose. You can't store nails in the water cooler between jobs. All right, the common drinking cup is prohibited. You have to have individual drinking cups for everyone. Where single service cups are to be used and supplied, both a sanitary container for the unused cups is required and a receptacle for disposing of the used cup. You got to have a little cup dispenser and a trash can. Toilets uh, from table D1. Um, this is according to the number of employees you have. If you have 20 or less employees on a job, you're required to have one toilet. 20 or more employees, one toilet and one urinal per 40 workers. And if you have 200 or more, one toilet and one urinal per 50 workers. Okay, occupational noise exposure, typically they, they make you solve a problem, uh, calculate one of these um, unity problems they call them. And they, what they'll have in table D2 are permissible noise exposure levels. And so you see the decibels over here, the DBAs, and then the number of hours or, or minutes that you're allowed to hear these noise per eight hour shift. And now the calculating unity, as they call it, to calculate the exposure, you divide the exposure time by the maximum exposure time allowed in day, table D2, then add up all the exposure times. If the result is greater than one, which they call unity, uh, then it exceeds the OSHA maximum noise exposure levels. This is very easy to calculate. And they probably will make you cal calculate one of these on the exam. So you want to know where this table D2 is in your copy of OSHA and be able to calculate the problem. Okay, here's an example uh, of a unity calculation. You have 1.5 hours at 97 decibels, 2.7 hours at 90 decibels, and 0.33 hours at 110 decibels. You divide the exposure time by the maximum limit to get the percentage. So 1.5 divided by 3. 
2.7 divided by 8, 0.33 divided by 0.5. You add up the percentages and see if they exceed 1. In this case, uh, it comes to 1.49, and so this is 1.5 times the maximum daily allowable noise level, so the worker cannot be exposed to this noise level. Illumination. This is another thing that, that, that they're pretty particular about, is um, areas of operation and the minimum amount of illumination that you're allowed to have. And they, rather than saying watts or something, they use the term foot candles which, uh, you know, you don't hear that often. But such as in general construction areas, you're required to have five foot candle lighting. General construction areas where concrete placement, excavation, and waste areas, you're required to have three foot candles of lighting. Indoors, warehouses, corridors, hallways, five candle foot power. And then in tunnel shafts and general underground work areas, again, five foot candles. And then in your first aid station, infirmaries, and offices, you're required to have 30 foot candles. Okay, the next thing is firefighting equipment, fire extinguishers, and small hose lines. A fire extinguisher rated not less than 2A shall be provided for each 3,000 square feet of the protected building area or major fraction thereof. Travel distance from any point of the protected area to the nearest fire extinguisher shall not exceed 100 feet. Fire extinguisher data. You need to know where to find table F1 in your OSHA book and know how to find information on that table. For example, what is the annual maintenance procedure for a carbon monoxide fire extinguisher? It needs to be weighed semi-annually. Flammable and combustible liquids. Indoor storage of flammable and combustible liquids, no more than 25 gallons a flammable or combustible liquid shall be stored in a room outside of an approved storage cabinet. Storage cabinets shall be constructed of a minimum of one inch plywood exterior grade that shall not bread down or delaminate under standard fire test. The cabinet shall be labeled in conspicuous letters flammable keep away. Storage outside buildings, storage of containers shall not exceed 1,100 gallons in any one pile or area. Piles or groups of containers shall be separated by a five-foot clearance. Piles or groups of containers shall not be nearer than 20 feet to the building. A ventilation in, in, in the buildings. Fresh air shall be supplied in sufficient quantities to maintain the health and safety of the workmen where natural means of fresh air supply is inadequate mechanical ventilation needs to be provided. Temporary heating devices uh, shall be installed to provide clearance to combustible material not less than the amount shown on the table below. And so they've got a table F4 under uh, heating devices and they show you the number of inches your heater has to be away from the wall or any, or any section. Sign signals and barricades. Exit signs when required shall be lettered in legible red letters and not less than six inches high on a white field and the principal stroke of the letter shall be at least three-fourths inch in width. All right, materials handling, storage, use and disposal. Brick stack shall not be more than seven feet in height. When a loose brick stack reaches a height of four feet, it shall be tapered back two inches in every foot of height above four feet. Safety belts, lifelines and lanyards. Uh, lifeline safety belts and lanyards shall be used for employees safeguarding. Any safety belt or lanyard subjected to in-service loading shall be immediately re removed from the work area and shall be not used again until it is uh, tested to make sure that it has, hasn't been uh, damaged. Lifeline shall be secured above the point of operation to an anchorage or structural member capable of supporting a minimum dead weight of 5,400 pounds. Lifelines used on rock scaling operations or in areas where the lifeline may be subject to cutting or abrasion shall be a minimum of 7 8 inch wire core manila rope. Tools and hand tools. All other hand powered tools such as circular saws, chainsaws, and percussion tools without positive accessory holding means shall be equipped with a constant pressure switch that will shut off the power when the pressure is released. Power operated hand tools shall be tested. This is a test question comes up all the time. 
power hand tools shall be tested each day before loading to see that safety devices are in proper working condition. The method of testing shall be in accordance with the manufacturer's recommended procedure. So if, if in theory you put your tools into the, into the uh, job site and one of them's broken and somebody gets hurt, you're responsible. If you didn't test every one of those tools every morning to make sure that they're in satisfactory condition. And if any of your tools are not in satisfactory condition, you can be sued for it. Scaffolding. Mason's adjustable supported scaffold or Mason's multipoint adjustable scaffold means a continuous run suspension scaffold designed to be used for Mason's. Maximum intended load means the total load of all persons, equipment, tools, materials, transmitted loads, and other loads reasonably anticipated to be applied to the scaffold. The capacity of the scaffold is its own weight and at least four times the maximum intended load applied or transmitted to it. Each suspension rope, including connecting hardware, used on non-adjustable parting without failure at least six times the maximum intended load applied to the transmitted rope. Criteria for supported scaffolds. Supported scaffolds with a height or to base width, including outrigger supports if used a ratio more than four to one, shall be restrained from tipping by guying, tying, bracing, or equivalent means as follows. Guys, ties, and braces shall be installed at locations where horizontal members support both inner and outer legs. So what you have to do is look in OSHA and see what they're talking about. They're basically saying that any of these scaffoldings that get very high, you have to start tying them off to the building and actually bolting them to the building so they can't uh, fall over. Falling object protection off of scaffolding. Where used tow boards shall be capable of withstanding, without failure, a force at least 50 pounds applied to any downward or horizontal direction at any point along the tow board. Horse scaffoldings, or what we used to call um, horses, shall not be constructed or arranged in more than two tiers and 10 feet height, or 10 feet in height. So you can't, you're not supposed to stack horses on top of one another which makes common sense. Training requirements for scaffolding. The employer shall have each employee who performs work while on a scaffold trained by a person qualified in the subject matter to recognize the hazards associated with the type of scaffold being used and to understand the procedures to control or minimize these hazards. So in other words, before you let any of your employees on a scaffolding, you're supposed to have had them trained by someone who's qualified to train them to safe operating procedures for scaffolding. If anything goes wrong and you haven't trained them, you're, you can be subject to a lawsuit and being fined. A float or ship scaffold, the maximum intended load of a float or ship scaffold is 750 pounds. Fall protection system criteria and practices, the top edge height of top rails or equivalent guardrail system members shall be 42 inches plus or minus 3 inches above the working level. When conditions warrant, the height of the top edge may exceed the 45 inch height provided the guardrail system meets all other criteria of this paragraph. Okay, so you're supposed to have a 42 inch handrail or a railing system around the top of scaffolding. Helicopter hand signals are often used for cranes, derricks, and hoists. Therefore, you're going to go to your OSHA book and, and usually in the front of the back of the OSHA book, they'll have a, a page full of symbols of uh, hand signals. And then they'll ask you to identify what some of these hand signals mean. You'll match them up with the, the pictures. And these are called helicopter hand signals. And they'll call them something like helicopter hand signals or they'll call them crane or derrick hand signals. And on the page in OSHA, it's going to say helicopter hand signals. They're the same thing. There's not, they're not different hand signals. Site clearing. All equipment used in the site clearing operations shall be equipped with rollover guards meeting the requirement of subpart B. In addition, rider operated equipment shall be equipped with an over, overhead and rear canopy guard meeting the following requirements. 
The overhead covering of the canopy structure shall be not less than one-eighths inch steel plate or quarter inch woven wire mesh with openings no greater than one inch. Okay, so th this is something else they like to ask is what is the, what is the required uh, size or the required thickness of steel plate on a, on a uh, say a backhoe or something like that and then you have to go through there and look it up. And all these are all everything in OSHA is comes out of 1926 the, and then you just have uh, paragraphs out of 1926. The competent person, they, they, they use this term, means one who is capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the surrounding or working conditions which are unsanitary hazardous or dangerous to employees and who has authority to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate the problems. So this comes up, is a, was a competent person present on the job? And if they determine that a competent person was not present when something goes wrong, which in other words means some sort of supervision, then uh, again, you're in trouble, you can be fined about excavations they have a number of uh, rules concerning excavating the means of egress from trenches uh, shall be a stairway ladder or ramp or other safe means of egress shall be located in a trench excavations that are four feet or more in depth so as to require no more than 25 feet of lateral travel for employees the excavations are one of the number one ways that people get hurt on the construction job then they go through the various types of soil and they will tell you the requirements for type A, type B, type C soil. For example, type A soils, the slope of an excavation 20 feet or less in depth shall have a maximum allowable slope of 3 quarters to 1. Slopes of ex excavations 12 feet or less in depth shall have a maximum allowable slope of 1 half to 1. And type B soil, all simple slope excavations 20 feet or less in depth shall have a maximum allowable slope of 1 to 1. Type C soil. All simple slope excavations of 20 feet or less in depth shall have a maximum allowable slope of 1 and a half to 1. Okay, and the next section is power transmission, or in other words, dealing with electricity. Uh, no employee shall be permitted to approach or take any conductive object without an approved insulating handle closer to exposed energized parts than shown in table V1. The minimum working distance and minimum clear hot stick distances stated in table V1 shall not be violated. The minimum clear hot stick distance is that for the use of live line tools held by linemen when performing live line work. So they're applying the, the rules that apply to um, people who work for the electrical company and your minimum working clear hot stick distance is for 72 to 121 volts is 3 feet 4 inches and if you're dealing with 230 to 242 volts it's 5 feet. So you have to stay back that, that distance away from working. All right, again, we're going to deal with ladders. When portable ladders are used for access to an upper landing surface, the ladder side rail shall extend at least three feet above the upper landing in which the ladder is to be used to gain access. All right, that's something they, they almost ask on every exam, is how far must the ladder be extended above the roof line? It's three feet. Toxic and hazardous substances, you must keep descriptions and documentation of toxic and hazardous materials used on your job for a period of 30 years. Annual summary. The annual summary shall be posted no later than February 1st and shall remain up at the main job site uh, until March 1st. Reporting deaths to OSHA. Within eight hours after the death of any employee from a work-related incident, or an inpatient hospitalization of three or more employees as a result of a work-related work accident, the employer of any employees so affected shall orally report the fatality or multiple hospitalizations by telephone or in person to the area office of OSHA administration. 
you, you're required to keep your OSHA records for five years. Okay, remember state of Florida requires you to keep their records for three years. The IRS requires you to keep their records for four years. And OSHA's five years. The end.